Hello and welcome to uh, ACUR at ANU student presentation session. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional uh, lands we meet and pay respects to elders past and present. My name is Jules Lombers um, and I'll be chairing the session today. Um, the first presenter for today is Natalie Smith. When you're ready. Hi everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. It says that the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Can everyone see that? So just seeing my slideshow, right? Okay, perfect. So hi everyone, I'm Natalie and today I'll be discussing cancer immunotherapy. Typically when you think of cancer treatment, you might imagine long months of chemotherapy and radiation. However, in recent years, new tools have been added to our kit of cancer therapies. Immunotherapies artificially stimulate the immune system to treat cancer, improving on the body's natural ability to fight the disease. These drugs are the future of cancer therapy and have significantly improved survival for some patients with cancer. However, there is a lot of room for improvement. I believe that the immune system is the most complex system in the body. It is an incredibly diverse yet specific network of cells, tissues and messenger molecules. Like the brain, the immune system has a memory and can learn from past experiences, making it a powerful tool to use in our fight against cancer. In fact, the immune system can detect and kill cancer cells. T cells are the conductors of the immune system and natural killer cells, as the name suggests, are potent killing machines. These two cellular populations are the major players in anti-cancer immunity. When they recognize cancer, they can release molecules that draw more cells to the site or can directly bind to and kill the cancer itself. However, the fact that cancer does occur in humans indicates that this process is not perfect. Cancers are incredibly smart, and one of the ways that they avoid immune killing is by suppressing the immune system. The immune system has a natural set of breaks that maintain balance and prevent overinflammation. However, they are often manipulated by cancer. These breaks are called immune checkpoints, and programmed death protein 1, or PD-1, shown here, is a type of immune checkpoint found on the surface of a T cell. When it encounters PDL1 on the surface of a dendritic cell or tumor cell, it forms a complex and the T cell is deactivated. However, blocking this interaction from happening is like cutting the brakes on the immune system, allowing it to unleash its anti tumor potential. And anti PD1 drugs, they do just this. Shown in purple on the diagram, this tra treatment consists of an antibody, a Y shaped protein used to identify and neutralize this immune off switch. These anti-PD-1 drugs have become standard treatment for a variety of cancers. However, response is low and unpredictable at only 15 to 50%. Untangling the mechanisms of non-response to increase response to anti-PD-1 treatment is a major obstacle for the field to overcome. To understand how to improve response to anti-PD-1, we first need to know how these drugs work. Immune cells travel on a highway from tissue to blood to lymph node and back and a lymph node is a filter for the blood that acts as an immune control center. Anti-PD-1 drugs enter the tumor draining lymph node, which acts as a filter for blood from the tumor, where they activate the immune system to generate fresh and active cells that traffic through the blood to the tumor and carry out anti-cancer immunity. With the end goal being to determine if a patient will respond to this treatment before it's given, a significant amount of work has been done to define the immune systems of responders and non-responders. My lab group previously found that people who failed to respond to this treatment had a relative decrease in peripheral T and NK cell populations. Peripheral here refers to cells in the blood as opposed to in tissues or tumors. Interestingly, naive T cells were also decreased in non-responders. Naive T cells are in a stage between maturity and activation. They circulate the periphery searching for toxins, viruses, or cancerous cells. However, they do not enter non-immune tissues such as tumors. For this reason, a decrease in their numbers is particularly interesting as it suggests that systemic immunosuppression is occurring in non-responders. This means their whole immune system is suppressed, not just cells located near the tumor. 
This signature for non-response was present before the treatment was given, did not change over time, and was only present in cancer patients. As we now know what defines the immune system of a non-responder, we can start to consider why this signature might emerge. The decrease in naive T cells gave us a clue. The T cell receptor is how these cells see their environment. It consists of the alpha and the beta chain, as well as this CD3 zeta tail that extends inside the cell. When naive T cells circulate in the periphery, antigen comes into contact with their receptor, and this activates that CD3 zeta chain and sends a survival signal to the cell. CD3 zeta also plays a crucial role in keeping T and NK cells active. It's likely that something is going wrong with the CD3 zeta chain in non-responders, which is causing this decrease in T and NK cells. In fact, loss of CD3 zeta chain has been reported in cancer patients. Cells need food to survive, and this often comes in the form of amino acids. Arginine is an amino acid that is crucial for immune system reactivity. It's represented here in purple. The arginine is broken down by the enzyme arginase, shown in green, which reduces the amount of arginine available for immune cells. There is a well-defined relationship between T and NK cell expression of CD3 zeta and availability of arginine. In fact, low concentrations of arginine cause T and NK cells to lose expression of CD3 zeta and therefore have reduced ability to respond to antigen. This means that the more active that arginase is, the less arginine is available and CD3 zeta is more likely to be lost, causing, CD, causing immunosuppression. This led me to ask, what is the relationship between expression of CD3 zeta, arginase activity and response to anti-PD-1? To investigate this relationship, I have access to more than 60 blood samples from two cohorts of lung cancer patients. These whole blood samples have been separated into immune cells and plasma for analysis. First, I will work up and perform a colorimetric assay to determine the activity of arginase in plasma samples. Colorimetric analysis is a method of determining the concentration of a chemical of interest in a solution before, through a color change reaction. I would then select samples with high or low arginase activity and immune cells matched to these samples of interest will be used for cytometric analysis. Cytometry is the measurement of the characteristics of cells and will allow me to determine the expression of CD3 zeta in peripheral TNNK cells, as well as to define each sample's peripheral immune populations. After searching the literature and teaching myself a little bit of chemistry, I designed this colorimetric assay. My method is as follows. Arginase converts arginine to ornithine, which reacts with a dye, ninhydrin, to form a complex that has a red-orange color. The amount of color formed is determined by a plate reader and is proportional to the activity of the enzyme. The darker the color, the more active arginase is. Before you can use any new method in science, you need to ensure that it's measuring what you want it to accurately, selectively, and reproducibly. This process is called assay optimization. To ensure results from my experiment were consistent, I ran the same plasma samples on three different days and calculated the arginase activity. The difference between the activity values on different days was only 4%, which is great considering 10% is the accepted maximum. Many more tests were run to de determine the stability of reagents and develop my analysis pipeline. And this is myself and Manaz, who helped me with reagent selection and assay workup after our first successful plate run with my optimized assay. Next, I will run the lung cancer samples with this assay. Flow cytometry will be used to determine the expression of CD3 zeta. This is the chain inside the cell. Flow cytometry is a highly sensitive technique that is commonly used in immunology. It allows us to look at the expression of markers on the single cell level by tagging them with antibody fluorophores that will bind to a protein of interest in or on the cell. The cells are passed in front of a laser one by one and light is detected. And the amount of each color of light allows us to identify which markers are expressed on the cell. I hope to define a relationship between plasma arginase activity and CD3 zeta expression with this experiment. Cytometry by time of flight is a relatively new technique that builds on the foundations of flow cytometry. However, instead of staining cells with fluorophores, a metal isotope is used. The cells are vaporized one by one and the markers are identified by their mass. 
The CYTOV panel that I will use, shown here, includes over 40 different antibodies that will allow me to classify more than 150 cellular populations. This will supply me with some incredibly detailed and complex data and allow me to define the peripheral cell populations in patients with high or low arginase activity. Ultimately, my work aims to investigate the relationship between CD3 zeta, arginase, and response to anti-PD-1 for the first time. I expect that anti-PD-1 non-responders will have more active arginase in their plasma and less CD3 zeta in their T and NK cells. As these immune cells are starved of arginine, which is that important amino acid, they will become immunosuppressed. And these non-responders will also have decreased peripheral T and NK cell numbers. This work will assist me in untangling the how and why of non-response to anti-PD-1. Results from my work may indicate that inhibiting arginase could be an attractive therapeutic strategy to increase response to anti-PD-1. Stopping arginase from breaking down arginine could prevent T and NK cells from becoming starved and losing CD3 zeta. This could be a method to reverse immunosuppression in non-responders. And this would allow the cancer cells to be recognized and killed. Thank you to my honours supervisor, Dr. Helen Maguire, for her constant support. And thank you for listening. I would love to hear any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I would now like to open up for, we have five minutes for uh, questions. Um, you are right on time there, Natalie, well done. Um, so first I'd like to pass to the judges if they uh, have any questions. Um, so our judges, uh, uh, we have Associate Professor um, uh, Melissa um, Davis and uh, uh, SM uh, DF. Um, any questions from either of you? No questions? Um, so if any of the audience have any questions, you are welcome to uh, pop them into the Q&A there, um, or you can, uh, I think you can raise your hand and I can try to uh, take you off mute and you can ask, um, ask in real time. Ah, of course, or Luke, you may ask a question. Um, so that, that was very interesting. I've just got, so when you're looking at these markers, is there a specific therapeutic target that you're looking at beyond the, so you've got the receptor and you say you isolate it and find the definitive link. Is there a therapeutic application of this? Yes, actually, that's a good question. Um, so arginase inhibitors, so arginase is that enzyme, have actually entered clinical trials uh, alone and in combination with anti-PD-1. So that's, um, and the results are going to be released from that study in the next few months, which is really exciting. So that's providing some indication that inhibition of arginase, so these chemical inhibitors, could be a really attractive therapeutic strategy. And what my study is kind of trying to do is understand the mechanism of why, and that could be through that CD3 zeta chain. Tamara. Um, still my question, I was gonna see if there was any trials where they'd done like adjuvant um, treatments, but I guess on that note, because a lot of um, immunotherapies have like downstream immune adverse effects, is arginine involved in many other pathways or is it relatively cancer specific? Or I guess it's in the immune specific of the zeta chain expression. Yeah, so arginine has like a lot of roles in immune activation and vasodilation and promoting blood flow and everything. But um, that's why they are looking at relatively specific adjuvant therapies such as arginase inhibitors rather than adju adjuvant therapies that would just activate the whole immune response relatively unspecifically. So if we can untangle why non-response is occurring, we can kind of target that pathway quite specifically, which should reduce the immune adverse effects. However, like with, with immunotherapy, it is quite well known that there are immune adverse effects, but there's no magic bullet in the treatment of cancer. And these side effects are far less severe than the ones that we'd associate with chemo or radiation. So in the end, it is like a net gain.
Okay, uh, any other questions from anybody? We've still got time for one more. Um, I just have a quick one. Um, Natalie, I was just wondering, um, why did you choose this as your topic? Um, that's a good question. I love the immune system. I think it's really interesting. Um, there's a lot of autoimmune diseases in my family. So I've, ever since a young age, I've been super fascinated with what's going on and wanting to be able to understand like what my mum's medication does and all of that. So that really led me to be fascinated in the immune system. And I just think that cancers are so so evil, so interesting. Like they're just so smart in the ways that they take the body's defenses and turn them against us. So it's just a, a, an area where there's always constant challenges and something new popping up. And yeah, I just find it fascinating. Thank you so much. No problem, thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. So we're now going to move to our second presenter, um, which, uh, who is Tamara Bock. So over to you Tamara, when you're ready. Thank you. Um, I'm also just needing access to share my screen, I think. It's not letting me do it at the moment. There we go. Okay, so that's showing. Perfect. All right, thank you, Jules. So over an eight week summer scholarship program with the Dendritic Soul Research Group based at Anzac Research Institute in Sydney, I was investigating the role of CD300 molecules in regulating immune responses, in particular interest in COVID-19. So last year, there was a paper published by the Lawson Health Research Institute in the United States, and they found that CD300 molecules along with a number of other molecules identified in the blood, were able to predict whether people would uh, get COVID-19 or not. And another interesting thing that they found was one of the molecules, CD300F, was able to accurately predict ICU outcome. So here, in a nutshell, this graph is showing that patients with high levels of CD300F did not survive their ICU stay, whereas those with low levels uh, did survive from their COVID-19. And so essentially this paper was very interesting to us as we were the first to categorize these uh, CD300 molecules, but also it was the first to our knowledge that these molecules have been reported in the blood. So naturally these are actually bound to the surface of immune cells. And so not only did we seek to understand how they were becoming present in the blood, but there's no widely available or fast tool that would allow people to clinically screen for this. The targeted proteomic method that this paper used is quite an expensive and time laborious um, method that's not feasible in a clinical setting. So essentially what we do know about these molecules in the blood, as I am categorizing them, is that they can tell us a lot about the state of a disease for a patient and also what approaches may be useful for clinicians to take. So viruses such as COVID-19 will infect cells in the lung and uh, release a number of damage associated molecules into the blood. And our immune cells in responding to infections release a number of molecules also that allow them to communicate with one another and to mediate an immune response. And so these molecules, like I mentioned, can be detected and tell a doctor how severe this patient is and what steps they should take. What is interesting, though, is immune regulatory molecules, such as the CD300 molecules, are not classically secreted in this sense. So we are aware that immune cells have the capacity to secrete or release molecules into the blood. But CD300 molecules are actually expressed on the surface of immune cells, and it's useful to think of them as a puzzle piece. So these molecules that our immune system have can mediate whether our immune system attacks or ignores based on what happens when they interact with their natural puzzle piece that matches with them in their environment. So upon binding, it stimulates an immune cell and it tells them to regulate certain genes that allow for inflammatory signaling or perhaps inhibition, whatever action is most appropriate. And so given that CD300 molecules are expressed on the surface, we wanted to know how we can measure them in the blood and how we can understand why they become detached. 
And we did this using antibodies. So as Nat mentioned before, antibodies are these Y-shaped molecules. And you can think of them in a sense as another puzzle piece for certain molecules. And we know that there's eight CD300 molecules, CD300A through to H, and our lab has engineered a number of antibodies that bind these molecules, and they allow for us to measure them or detect them in the blood. And so after reading this Lawson study where they found soluble CD300 molecules detached from the surface of cells were present, I aim to design a tool using our antibodies that would allow us to detect CD300 molecules in soluble form. And I also aim to understand how these molecules were becoming detached from immune cells and what this might implicate in the progression of different diseases. And we hypothesized that in healthy individuals, soluble CD300 molecules would be at low levels, but this would be elevated in disease states such as COVID-19. And we also thought that increases in the soluble levels may be from immune stimulation. So these immune cells are responsible for directly detaching them. And so the tool that we designed is something called an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And essentially, our antibodies get coated to a plastic plate, and these are specific for CD300 antibodies. And what this means is when you add your sample, shown in purple here, a CD3 molecule will bind, but all of the other non-specific proteins will be washed out because we block the plate with these other proteins. And then we sandwich the CD300 molecules with our other antibodies that our lab has developed. And then essentially another antibody comes in with a HRP polymer, and this is actually an enzyme. And so this also is a color change reaction. And this enzyme here allows for us to add in OPD. And essentially what happens is a color change occurs and it is proportional to the amount of CD300 molecule that has been captured. So we're looking to actually quantify how yellow this well becomes, which you can visibly see, and it lets us know how much CD300 molecule may be present in a patient blood sample. And this is using antibodies our lab has produced, so we know um, that they're specific for these molecules. And essentially the first step before adding in patient blood was to work out are these proteins or these molecules actually stable in soluble form and can they be detected when they're not attached to cells? And so we use these hybrid recombinant molecules that we know are in soluble form and we put them into our assay at various concentrations and we were able to measure them and produce a standard curve. And so here on the side, this is just representative of how much color change they were. So the higher the concentration, the more of a color change we saw. We then look to see if they could be detected not only in soluble form, but when they were mixed in with the blood. And so we deliberately put in these uh, soluble molecules into the blood, and we found that they still followed the same standard curve. There was a slight reduction in detection, but this was not a significant change. So given that these molecules could successfully be detected in the blood, we then gathered seven healthy donors from Concord Hospital, and we looked at just naturally, how much of CD300E and CD300F, we just chose to focus on two of the family members, were present. And to confirm our hypothesis, we found that CD300F and E were present at low levels in healthy donors. And you can see here at the bottom, it was between uh, 6 to 93 nanograms per mil for F and 0.1 to 12.4 for E. So it was quite close to our negative control, but there was variation where some donors had elevated levels. And this was exciting to us as it was the first to we know that um, patients can actually increase the levels of these molecules in their blood. And we're hoping that's dependent on immune status and whether you know, they're compromised to certain diseases. And to test this, we took some immune cells, also isolated from these healthy patients that we have been given, and we were able to stimulate them with factors called LPS, interferon, or CPG. And essentially, these are what our body would naturally occur, um, or sorry, come into contact with during a viral or a bacterial infection. And we hypothesized that once these cells have been stimulated, they will decrease their surface expression of CD300 molecules, and they will actually perhaps detach them. And to test the surface expression and the detachment were used a few different methods. So flow cytometry uses the same antibodies that we used before. However, a flow cytometer can measure the amount of antibody bound on a cell 
and therefore tell us how much surface expression the cell has. And we hypothesize that if this detachment is occurring, the liquid or the cell culture that these cells have been grown in and have been stimulated in may contain those soluble molecules. And we can put that liquid directly into our tool. And so we found that up the top here, we have our flow cytometry plots. And these peaks here represent how much expression of a molecule that they have. And up the top is our unstimulated sample. And then these three at the bottom are our ones that have been exposed to those stimulating factors. And we found that there was a slight decrease in CD300E and F. However, there was no soluble detection. So where all these levels are low, we had a few outliers here. But essentially, the immune cells could change their surface expression, but did not increase their soluble secretion. And so we hypothesized perhaps cell to cell interactions or interaction with damaged tissue is required. So essentially we have, for the first time, developed an assay to detect these soluble molecules in the blood. We are not yet sure what their origin is. And we have been given um, some COVID-19 patient blood at the hospital that our lab is currently running. And hopefully we'll be able to align that it is associated with disease, it is increased in those poor prognosis patients, and we can look at therapeutic potentials there. And we'll continue to investigate where these molecules are coming from. And I'd just like to say thank you to my entire lab that's been supporting me this year, who have also been placed with my honours and all of the help in this project. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much and within time as well. Um, so again, I'd like to pass over to the judges. Are there any questions from the judges? Yes, Esam. Uh, you're on mute, Esam. Um, you're still on mute. I'm mute. There we Hello. go. Yes. Um, What's the limit of detection of your methods? Like you, you try to detect the CD3 molecules and you try to correlate them with either the person is, is uh, COVID positive or not. Um, yeah, I, I got this point at the end of the presentation because you said these are all oh, the CD3 molecules, C, uh, CD300 molecules are present in low levels in healthy donors as well. So. I'm a bit like, first I would like to know, did you, did you calculate the limit of detection of your methods? The limit of detection? Yeah, like how low can you detect? Because you- Oh, how low, right. So, yeah, so we, what we did, we did have like a negative control, obviously. So it was whether it was the blood or the, um, just like a liquid diluent to show like if it's not present, how much of a background color change are we observing? And then I'll just go back a little bit. So the lowest um, we experienced for CD300E was 0.1 nanograms per mil. Um, essentially, physiologically, we wouldn't expect them to be present in those healthy donors. So we're um, kind of confirmed that the pot, like the limit for detection as to how what the capacity or how increased it could become we're not currently aware um and essentially that was the, there was this paper to show that high levels have been associated with poor disease but there was no tool to actually test them at, at all yet so we've we have worked out i guess a minimum baseline range in which we can detect them um, and then we have been given these COVID-19 patients but unfortunately in the scope of the eight weeks that I was there with them I wasn't able to test them myself um, but then they would be able to establish I guess that maximum limit of um, is it elevated at all because it was only the one study that has released this so it might come back and find that no it's not there um, but yeah so we, we have established I guess as a minimum, we can detect it in low levels, but we're not sure yet what that maximum limit might be. Okay, so it's a yes or no test, like negative positive. It's not a quantitative test. No, so it can be quantitative. So where the color change um, is being detected, so it'll be, um, you can put it through a plate reader and it measures the absorbance of the light at a certain um, nanometer. So the more um, molecules that it has captured, 
the more color change there'll be and it would have a higher absorbency reading. So we did find, um, sorry, I'm just gonna flick back in my slides a little bit. So let me, sorry, I'm struggling just to, there's just a nice graph that might. So here at the bottom, for example, they're all quite in a low threshold, but this, uh, the coloured in one is our positive control. So we can quantify that we know there is exactly five micrograms per mil in that sample because we've deliberately spiked it in. And then we can quantify between all these different patients, whilst they're all quite at low levels here, we can look at, okay, this one might have, you know, um, 0.25 micrograms per mil or someone have, might have 0.1. And if we establish a threshold for, if we know above five micrograms per mil in a patient with COVID-19, that's gonna flag them to say, you're gonna have poor ICU outcome, therefore you should be put on ventilators earlier or you should be put on different um, therapies earlier because we know that you're going to succumb to a more severe disease progression. So that ideally is the direction that we're hoping to take this study. Um, so we know that there, we have found some fluctuation. It is an assay that allows us to directly quantify the level of these molecules. Um, what's missing now is just taking it into those patients and confirming whether it, where the there is a link or not. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Melissa, did you have a quick question at all? No? Okay. Um, any more? We've got time for one quick question if anyone had one. Natalie? Hi, yes, that was a really great presentation. Um, I was just wondering, what does the, the CD300 play? What role does it play in the body in normal immunology? You said it was normally bound to the surface of immune cells. So what kind of um, processes is that molecule involved in? Yeah, so there was um, probably too much to delve into the regulation in a normal sense. But so they are primarily phospholipid binding molecules. So in a nutshell, um, most of them play roles in regulation of apoptosis, which is the clearance of dead cells. Um, but they've also been found to be involved in immune migration, um, general activation and inhibition. So CD300E, for example, regulates um, like the activation of DAT12 and FCR gamma dependent like cell proliferation and activation of the immune system. Um, so all, all sorts of things, simply put. But that was what was interesting to us is because we know so much about their roles when they're bound to the surface, but as far as what they're doing circulating in the blood, we have no idea. Okay, thank you very much. We are out of time now. So we're going to move on to our final presenter. Thank you, Tamara, that was excellent. Um, so uh, this is the final presentation for this session now. Um, so without further ado, uh, I would like to present uh, Luke Waldy. So Luke, take it away. Hello. Um, try and get this to work. Right. So hello, my name is Luke Waldy and today I'm going to be presenting a summer research project in which we created a diagnostic panel for methylation biomarkers. Before we begin, I'd like to do a brief acknowledgement of country, where we acknowledge the traditional owners and the land in which we meet today. So, what was my project? Before we get started, I'll do an overview of who I am and what I did. Then we'll do background information essential to actually understand the technical details of the project, looking at aims and hypotheses, the methods, which is the meat of it, and finally the outcomes with overall clinical significance. So, who am I? I'm a third year Bachelor of Science student in my final year progressing into a Doctorate of Medicine next year at UQ. During my summer research project, I worked at the Prince Charles under Dr. Quan Fong, who's a thoracic specialist. So when I was given this project, the first thing I really asked myself was why look at young cancer, particularly as a younger person? As you can see in figure one, smoking rates have significantly decreased over the years. However, the age standardized mortality rate associated with lung cancer hasn't really changed. Furthermore, it's, the, it's associated with the highest mortality as in the most number of deaths of any form of cancer within Australia. We all know that DNA and cancer play an important role together with the modification and mutation of DNA heavily contributing to the formation of cancer. However, this has opened up a realm of precision medicine in which genes and genetic knowledge helps us tailor specific information 
for the pathogenesis of a cancer. This is emerging within the realm of epigenetics. Epigenetics is the, is the heritable uh, modification of DNA that doesn't actually affect the sequencing of the DNA itself. As you can see in figure five, it's almost like wrapping DNA, it's, it's almost as if wrapping wire around a barrel. When you wrap it really close, you can't get a proper read of the DNA. When environmental stresses influence it, you actually get the formation of cancer by the suppression of specific genes by methylation. So this kind of led to the research question, are epigenetic modifications a valid way of looking at cancer? I made this to my dad, he liked it very much. Well, when we looked at epigenetics and biomarkers, it actually is relatively well established. You can see that cancer biomarkers are the things that we need for early diagnosis and prognosis of cancer forms. We specifically looked at that in figure seven, you can see the middle one, the histones, we focus specifically on the methylation biomarkers, which helps contribute to solid tumors, such as in lung cancers. So what was the project? The aim was to produce a diagnostic panel of methylation from lung cancers. We hypothesized, we hypothesized that a methylation screen can be assembled and that can be used to inform choices when diagnosing a specific patient. Before we get started, it's important to establish the sample size and the target population we were looking at. We were looking at Australian patients with lung cancer. From 1996 to 2008, cancer samples of both lung cancer, LC, and normal lung, NL, were taken. This was split into two sets, the discovery set of 55 paired samples and the internal validation set, which was created using 21 of the same normal lung cancer samples and 126 of different lung cancer samples. In order to minimize bias, we split this into six different training sets. This will come into importance later on. The actual methylation arose using the human methylation 27 uh, bead chip array, which generated 27,000 probes of specific genes and their relevant methylation status. So what was the actual method that was done? Well, first of all, we did a class comparison, class prediction, external validation, PAM analysis, and internal validation. It sounds like a lot of steps, but we'll go through them one by one so we can actually understand why they were all done. The first thing was a class comparison. This class comparison was important for establishing that there actually was a difference between lung cancer and normal lung samples, uh, methylation status within our samples. As you can see in figure eight, there is actually a distinct difference in an unsupervised heat map clustering, where unsupervised is when the clustering occurs, the program doesn't actually know what is a lung cancer and what is a normal lung sample. So you can see there's two more or less distinct groups within that discovery set. Next class prediction was occurred where the program, where the BRB array program, which we used, examined the settings and then used that to examine the 27,000 probes to generate the most predictive 158 genes. So overall, we discovered 158 from 27,000, but further steps were needed. We implemented external validation. We examined 13 external databases using the gene lists within them to synthesize the list down to 24 genes when they had, and each, so 24 probes, where each probe had to have four or more positive sets in the database. So we've got it down to 24 probes from 27,000, and now we're starting to get the ability to use it as a diagnostic panel. We did PAM analysis, which was the prediction analysis of microarrays. This took the 24 probes and used modeling to generate the most predictive algorithm for it. This was relatively successful with an 88% accuracy and a relatively high sensitivity and specificity. We found that 14 genes overall were essential within that 24 probe set, i.e. several genes had several probes associated to them. To conclude, we did internal validation. This internal validation was using that internal validation training sets we spoke about, all six of them. But why do internal validation? Well, the reason we did it is to remove any sampling bias from the 55 analysis sets originally used. With this done, we could examine the externally validated 24 probe set using the internally validated training sets. 
The training sets can be seen here, but more importantly, in comparison to our initial BRB array output, which again was the program we used, it has a roughly similar mean correct um, classification, sensitivity and specificity. This therefore indicates that our internally validated set matched our discovery set, thereby validating our sets, uh, validating our diagnostic panel. So as you can see in figure nine, we went from 24,000 probes to 24 using multiple uh, waves of removal. This can be synthesized down to a 14 gene list with some of them, such as Hox B4, playing a significant role. This again summarizes it with the specific steps. A lot of it was using extremely high levels of significance, for example, one to the 10 to the negative seven, to eliminate a lot of the noise out of that 27,000%. So overall, we generated a diagnostic panel with 88% accuracy, and that accuracy was der derived from its weighted analysis of the genes. So each probe had a value, base, a value associated with it. And when you added all of the methylation value times the value, and then it was set against a specific cutoff value. There's the word value a lot there. So where now? Well, let's look at its placement in the existing literature. We externally validated that. So that provides supporting information. It's a rapidly moving and new field. Um, with an understanding of epigenetics portal for future actions. In a similar study, they found similar results with 87% sensitivity and 98% specificity. Future direction. We need prospect, uh, prospective validation of our diagnostic set in a clinical trial. Furthermore, the biological significance of the specific genes should be examined with hyper or hypomethylated status examined. Overall, we generated 24 probes, and this is my first research project, something that I really enjoyed. References. I'd like to give special thanks to Dr. Bowman and Dr. Yang for their assistance in screening patients. I'd like to give a special thanks to Dr. Fong for his help throughout the entire project. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so first I'll pass to the judges, if there are any questions from the judges. Okay, I will then pass open the floor to anyone else who ha may have uh, questions. Natalie. Hi, great presentation. I'm not sure if you went over this or not, but um, those probes that you used, um, were those selected because they are involved in methylation or do they have other functions in cancer? So we use the um, human array D chip, which is basically a set program. So it's a tw this data was probably, as you saw, the last one was collected, I think 2008. So the data itself was collected quite a while ago. So this is very, very early epigenetic information that was collected. Um, that 27 array chip was just a default commercial set. Uh, now they've actually developed the 450K that came out a couple of years ago. Um, and that again, examines 450,000. So the methylation array specifically, the raw data that was actually processed, some of them are important for cancer genes. So you've got Hox genes and all that. However, some of them were also just associated with general other methylation status. So it's a broad spectrum um, epigenetic modification examination. Great, any more questions? I'd like to know um, how you, um, you said that um, you put a slide in there, especially for your father. <laughs> um, so how much did your uh, family influence the way that you presented today, Luke? Um, well, the biggest thing was because epigenetics has only been re developed relatively recently. And we, like, we as a university cohort, only learnt it in our second year. It's a it's very easy to consider things as just understandable. So it was important to run it through them to actually take parts off and add parts that are more important. For example, the actual um, the actual role of genes and cancer doesn't matter as much in the style of this presentation because what we're focusing on 
is, that th is synthesizing established um, scientific knowledge into actually a diagnostic panel that can be clinically used. So, and also you need to make the presentations fun. So uh, that's the other aspect. Yeah, I wasn't, um, I wasn't thinking that your family had written it for you. I was just wondering <laughs> um, how much you um, asked them to, to, you know, get them to bounce the ideas off it. So, mm. yeah, I think it is important to be um, including people in your, when you're um, presenting. It's, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other questions? Look at that, Luke, you were so clear that no one has any questions for you. All right. Um, well, it looks like we will be finishing a little bit early. Um, so I, with that, I'd like to say congratulations to all of our presenters today. You've all done an excellent job. Thank you very much. Um, I would also like to say a very big thank you to um, both of our judges, um, Associate Professor Melissa Davis, thank you, um, and to SM um, Diff, thank you very much. Um, both of you um, and thank you to um, those who tuned in. Um, I know people stuck around and watched the presentation and many may watch it afterwards as well. Um, and um, you also will be able to watch your presentations back and share with family as well. So I hope you enjoy watching yourselves later on as well. So I have thoroughly enjoyed it as well and I've learned a lot and I certainly am feeling like the future is in good hands. I, I'm sure the judges feel the same as well. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.